Let's start tonight in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul is uh, speaking about his first time to come to Corinth and when he ministered to them and founded the church there. Let's start in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save or except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for a number of weeks, and we want to continue, but maybe take a little different tack on it. We've uh, seen where John told us, uh, well, really where Jesus told us, John just gave us a record by the Holy Ghost, of the different things that the, the Spirit of God would do, some of the specifics that Jesus talked to them about the Holy Spirit on the night that he was betrayed uh, shortly after the Last Supper was over. And we've seen that the Holy Spirit will bring all things to our remembrance that Jesus has said. He'll remind us of the truth of the Word, in other words. And he'll show us things to come. He'll testify of Jesus and acknowledge and glorify him first and foremost. Here we have something that Paul is telling us by the Holy Ghost that the Spirit of God reveals to us. Again, verse 9, he said, I has not seen nor his ear heard the things that he's prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now skip down with me to verse 14. And notice the contrast that he makes between two types of people. He said the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. He cannot know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man has to be the unsaved man. When he talks about the natural man, he's got to be talking about the unsaved. But then he goes further, verse 15, But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So he's contrasting a spiritual man with the natural man. Now let's keep reading in chapter 3. Going down to verse 1. You know as well as I do that Paul didn't write in chapter and verses. He's continuing the same thought in verse 1 of chapter 3. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? One translation says walk as mere men. Now he introduces another type of man here. As we said in verse 14 of chapter 2, he contrasts the natural man that cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God with the spiritual man who judges all things by the Spirit and certainly by the Word. Here he talks about the church at Corinth being carnal men. And he identifies their carnality by a couple of things. 
uh, this word carnal really means body ruled. So when he says you are carnal, your babes under Christ, you're carnal, he's saying you're body ruled. Well, isn't the natural man body ruled too? Isn't the unsaved ruled by his flesh? So what's the difference between the carnal man and the natural man? Salvation. But Paul is saying that even after we receive Jesus, even after we accept the sacrifice that Jesus has made, that won't necessarily show up in somebody's life. He identifies that they're carnal, body ruled, and then he says you walk as mere men. Well, then there must be a supernatural aspect to the spiritual man that the carnal man doesn't enter into. The spiritual man certainly is saved, just as the carnal man is saved. Paul talking about the carnal Christians, just as they are saved. But there is some supernatural aspect of walking in this life as a spiritual man that a carnal man doesn't experience. We know certainly that the natural man wouldn't experience that either. So Paul is simply saying, and in the case with the Corinthians, and remember the Corinthians have the, all the gifts of the Spirit in manifestation. Paul said in chapter 1, I think it's verse 7, that they come behind in no good gift. And then he makes direct reference to the gifts of the Spirit or the manifestations of the Spirit. He gives the greatest exposition, the most complete teaching on the operation of the Spirit in these nine different manifestations in chapter 12. But what about this spiritual man? What about this spiritual man? This spiritual man is somebody that judges things spiritually rather than a natural man who rejects the things of the Spirit of God altogether. And the carnal man lives by his senses according to the things that he thinks and feels here on this earth. Now, in line with the work of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, you may remember in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, where Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Verse 14 is interesting because it tells us why Jesus died on the cross for us. It tells us why he redeemed us. It's to that or so that the blessing come on the Gentiles. And then secondly, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus had two purposes in his sights when he went to the cross. He's bringing the blessing of Abraham unto the Gentiles. And he's enabling us to receive the promise of the Spirit, fulfilling the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, I'm going to read to you some of the things that the Bible says about the promise of the Spirit. I'm going to start in Ezekiel chapter 11. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord God, I will get, even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof, and all the abominations thereof from thence. And I will give them one heart... And I will put a new spirit within you. He's talking about the new birth. Remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. Now, before we read any further, let's talk about that for a minute. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Well, obviously, that's salvation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new spe species of being, a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. That certainly wasn't the case for the carnal church at Corinth. Old things passed away and all things became new. Well, certainly they were born again. Certainly the old spirit was taken out of them and the promise of the spirit was realized through the new birth. But that's as far as they went. So as far as old things passing away and all things becoming new, if you set the carnal Christian up next to the unsaved, the natural man, there would be no way for us to tell which was which unless the carnal Christian identified that they had made Jesus the Lord of their lives. That's the only way that we'd be able to tell. We wouldn't be able to see the difference. And I think that's 
very applicable to the church today. How much of the church today is carnal versus spiritual? I see this manifesting in all kinds of different areas of our lives. We live in a unique situation here in America whereby we have the privilege to worship God like we want to in the foundation for this country which was based on freedom of worship. But clearly the church, and even in this present day, the majority of the population in America still identifies themselves as Christians. Well, that was, even though the numbers are dwindling, even now it's still a majority. So why can't the church elect officials to govern justly and righteously? I, th I see a lot of it, and, and folks, I'm not trying to be political but politics is the one area where the devil operates the most visibly. It's the one area that he identified as having the glory of the kingdoms that he tempted Jesus with. How could Christians vote for a political party that supports and advances the murder of unborn children? And is there anything, and I'm, I'm not railing on anybody. I'm not trying to tell anybody how to vote. I'm not responsible for how you vote. I am responsible for how I vote. But what justification is there for the church to support the murder of unborn children? Murder is identified in Scripture as the shedding of innocent blood. What better word is there to use concerning abortion? What Christian would vote for a party, political party, that has voted God out of their platform? Their political platform how can a christian support that well folks there's only one kind of christian that can support that and that's a carnal body rule christian so we've got the same thing going on maybe even in a bigger scale that's what paul is with the back to ezekiel chapter 11 verse 19 and i will give them one heart and i will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they might walk in my statutes. Get this. Here's the reason for the new birth from God's perspective. That they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Let me show you also Ezekiel chapter 36 beginning in verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. He goes on to tell some of the other benefits of entering into the, the day that we live in. The relationship that we have with God through the new birth. I will also save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for the corn and will increase it and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field that you shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. So again, in both of these prophecies that, I, that Ezekiel delivers, it comes down to the new birth, which is God's ultimate purpose and design for redemption. The purpose that God identifies is so that we can write the law of God in our hearts. Well, then the, the difference between the carnal Christian and the spiritual Christian, the carnal man and the spiritual man, has to be the Word of God written in our hearts then. That has to be what makes the difference. And where the spiritual man judges all things, notice it doesn't say he judges all people. 
it says he judges all things. He's judging all things by the word of God that's in his heart. Look with me to, to uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Most translations translate that last phrase, spiritual worship rather than reasonable service. See, we Pentecostals are good about talking about worshiping in spirit, and we sing in tongues, and we think that's what it is. And thank God there's, that, there's some benefit to that, spiritual benefit to that. But spiritual worship is what you do with your body, not singing in tongues. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now notice he talks about the transformation process that takes place by the renewing of the mind. What transformation is he talking about? He's talking about the transformation from a carnal Christian to a spiritual one. The transformation that takes place through the renewing of the mind. The word renewing means reversal by repetition. So Paul is saying by the Holy Ghost to the Romans, writing to the Romans, or writing to the church. He's saying the same thing that God said to Joshua about writing the word in his heart. Joshua 1.8, when Joshua is being installed to take over for Moses' place to be the children of the, of the to be the leader of the children of Israel. God said, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest be able to, that thou mayest observe to do them. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He's saying the key to success is to meditate on the word. So the key to success is to be transformed from being the, the carnal Christian to the spiritual Christian from being a carnal believer still ruled by your body to being a spiritual believer spiritual child of God ruled by the word rather than our flesh one of the greatest things in, uh, in my experience one of the things that's made the greatest difference in my spiritual development when I started meditating on the things concerning scripture, concerning the righteousness of God. The Lord spoke three scriptures to my heart. And they came in rapid fire succession. I just wake it up in the morning. The place of revelation is called with wind awakening to speak. And oftentimes that's what the Lord did. Notice the connection here in Isaiah 41.10 with the absence of fear or the overcoming of fear and the righteousness of God. Let me read it to you again. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Dismayed means confused or broken down, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The second verse was Isaiah 54 verse 14. In righteousness shalt thou be established. The word established means to stand strong and firm, not be moved, not able to be moved. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Again, notice the relationship with overcoming oppression and terror and fear 
by being made the righteousness of God in him. The third scripture he gave me was verse 17, Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Folks, we need to realize, and I, I trust that everybody knows 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, where John is talking, speaking by the Holy Ghost. In the preceding verses, talking about the, the evil spirits that operate in this world. But then he says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. By virtue of the fact that we've been made righteous. By virtue of the fact that we've entered into the family of God, been placed into the family of God. By accepting the precious blood of Jesus as our substitutionary work. He goes on to say, because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. How is the greater one there? Because you've been made righteous. If it were not righteousness, if it were not for our righteousness through the blood of Jesus, it would be awfully hard for God to make an eternal plan of redemption for mankind. What would he base eternal redemption for mankind on if not righteousness? Ezekiel said twice, spoke by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost about how God will take the old heart, the old stony heart, out of our flesh. He's literally saying he removes the old spiritual, spiritually dead spirit that we were before we made Jesus the Lord of our lives. Now let's back up a little bit and remind ourselves how these things took place. We know that God and Eve not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that they ate thereof, they would surely die. Well, when they disobeyed God and Adam and Eve partook of that, they, their eyes were opened and they saw that they were naked and they were ashamed. Well, folks, clothes didn't fall off of them all of a sudden. They had been naked the whole time. What was different is that they were not conscious of their flesh until after they sinned. There was no self-consciousness to them. Now, I personally believe that they were clothed with the light and the glory of God before the fall, similar to what Moses experienced when he came down from the mountain after having been in the presence of God for 40 days. You remember his face shined, and he didn't know it. But Aaron told him what the people were staying away from him for. And for some reason, some way or another, they talked him into putting a veil on his face. Why would he do that? I, I, that baffles me. It seems to me that Moses would have said, good. You need to see the difference. Be reminded of what God's glory is. Nowadays, we're trying to get the veil off. And Moses was putting one on. Well, when God said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you shall eat thereof, you shall surely die. They certainly didn't die physically that day. So what death is he talking about? He's got to be talking about spiritual death. He's got to be talking about unrighteousness. Paul's writing to the church, called it the spirit of, well, I lost it. I almost had it. The law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. Spiritual death passed upon all men. But the spirit of life, in Christ Jesus has replaced that what is that spirit of life in Christ Jesus it's righteousness it's righteousness if we had a hold on the truth of righteousness like we should have like I believe God wants us to have our bodies would not be subject to the work of the devil any more than Jesus was the Bible says Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. That means sickness had to come to him. That means he had to be tempted with sickness because we certainly are. We have no record of it. We have no inclination whatsoever in the four Gospels about what Jesus did whenever he was tempted to the devil other than the account in Matthew where the devil came to tempt him after he'd been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. But we know how Jesus tempted the devil in that instance. He quoted, he said, it is written, 
a man or he came to the earth as a man he spent some time talking about that very thing in John chapter 10 he talked about how the thief come, enters into the sheepfold some other way than the gate he's talking about the devil coming in and, and taking hold of the serpent's body to interact with Adam and Eve but he didn't do that he could have done that but he did things in a just and righteous manner. So he came to the earth born of a virgin and came in as a man. So he talks about the thief coming in some other way. But the shepherd coming in by the gate. So here Jesus is the son of God emptied of, of his heavenly power and glory. Taking upon himself the flesh of a man a human being. And then when the Holy Ghost came upon him when he was baptized by John in the Jordan River, then he began to do because of the anointing, not because of who he was, according to what he said at least. By the anointing power of God, he began to do signs and wonders and miracles to set other people free. We never see him using the power of God on himself. We never see him using the power of God to resist the devil or to take any action whatsoever for himself. The only thing that we know is what he said of himself, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, folks, if Jesus, who had no sin, no taint or experience of sin in his, in his life in any way, in his body in any way, in his soul in any way, if he recognized the importance of feeding on the word of God, how much more important is it for us? The carnal man judges by what he feels and what he sees. The spiritual man judges by the word of God that's in his heart. Job made a statement during his difficulties. He said, my pen is as the, as the my tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. The implication is we write the, the law of God or the word of God on our hearts with our tongue. Well, that fits with what Joshua 1.8 says that we quoted a minute ago. God tells Joshua, here's the key to success, the pathway to success for you. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Word means to speak or to mutter, in your In other words, to say to yourself, under your breath, over and over and over again. Over and over again. So there seems to be two types of confession. One is to write the word of God into your heart. And the other is when the word of God is taken root in your heart to speak things into existence or to speak things to change. When Jesus identified that in Matthew chapter 11, verse 23, Mark chapter 11, verse 23, he's identifying and defining how faith works. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Jesus is talking about the type of confession from the heart that makes changes in this natural realm. Well, how do we get the word of God in our heart to use it like that? By meditating it. And that's exactly the same thing Paul's talking about in Romans 12 too that we just read. That's the transformation process. Be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't be like a carnal Christian where you can't tell the difference between him and the unsaved. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or experience or determine what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Folks, there's no way to overestimate the importance of the word. It's impossible to overestimate the importance of the word. The word of God is what we're supposed to live by. Remember Jesus said, talking about the word, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
He's talking about a lifestyle. He's talking about a Holy Ghost lifestyle by speaking the Word of God. Speaking it into our hearts. Writing with our tongue on the table of our heart. And then speaking from our hearts to effect a change in the world that we live in. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We quoted verse 17. Let's look at it and then we'll look a little bit further as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Paul said, any man be in Christ be the new creature. All things that are passed away, hold all things become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. The word reconciled here means an exchange, a mutual exchange, a complete exchange of one thing for another thing, a complete exchange for the spiritual death that we were bound by to the eternal life that Jesus' sacrifice made for us. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, the good news of Jesus is that he paid the price. All that someone needs to do is to accept what he has done. Now look at verse 21. Obviously, he's talking about the new birth. He's talking about being ushered into the family of God. Verse 21, for he, God, has made him, Jesus, to be sent for us to do sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Folks, this is the promise of the Spirit through faith that we've entered into that Paul identifies in Galatians 3, 13, and 14. You are righteous. Your righteousness makes a way of escape. It sets up a defense from anything and everything the devil has to offer. It is a shield that surrounds you. It is armor that protects you. And it's a weapon. It's a weapon that enables you to overcome the enemy. Now, when I talk about a weapon, you may be thinking about the armor of God that's spoken of over in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul talked about the breastplate of righteousness. But that righteousness, that relationship with God, that right relationship with God. Righteousness means we don't have to ever be ashamed or feel guilty about anything that's ever happened to us because redemption took, took it all away. And if we do stumble and fall, then we ask God to, uh, we confess our sins and ask for God's forgiveness. And he forgives us in every case. And then those sins are wiped away. We can live every moment of our lives sin-free, free from the guilt of sin with the knowledge. And it takes knowledge. It takes putting the Word of God into your heart, renewing your mind to the truth of these things. But because forgiveness is instantaneous, as soon as we miss it, we can confess that sin and have it removed so that God never remembers it. Now, we have to work a little harder on that so that we don't remember it. But the Bible says God forgets our sins for his own sake. So that righteousness, that right relationship with God enables us to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, as an offensive weapon. See, righteousness is not just defense. Righteousness sets you in a position to use the Word again. Righteousness of God that we've been made enables us to use the word of God to overcome anything and everything the enemy has. No wonder we have to overcome them, as John said, because greater is it in us than in the world. Because you've been made righteous, the Holy Spirit inside you is the essential of your face, the trial you'll ever wind up in the middle of. It's greater than any of that you work of the devil. I do not fear because God is with me. I will not be dismayed for he is on my side. He strengthens me. He helps me. 
He upholds me with the right hand of his righteousness. And in that righteousness I stand. And oppression stays far from me. For I do not fear. And terror does not come nigh me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment against me I condemn. This is my heritage as a child of God. And my righteousness is of God. Folks, you get that down on the inside of you. The truth of that opening our eyes, just a glimpse. And the devil comes to the realization that he doesn't have a a target on your back anymore. I can't tell you what it started, what effect it's had on me when I started actively confessing being made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It was something I hesitated to do for a long time because I thought I knew. Why well, spend my time confessing something I already know to be true? But the way I know it to be true now as opposed to the way I knew it to be true then. It's like the difference between night and day. You have been made righteous. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how you've messed up. I don't care what sin you've fallen into or how often you've fallen into it. None of those things change the fact, the reality that you've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. And there's nothing the devil can do to cancel that out. Not a thing in the world. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're just as righteous as Jesus because your righteousness came the same way as him. See, when he was made sin, he stood in the place of sin and death and the exchange that he made for taking the sin and spiritual death that was ours means it became his. Now, you can't be righteous and be bound by sin and death at the same time in that context at least. So when he was made to be sin, remember 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him to be sin. That means it became his being, his essence. That means he stopped being righteous. But the Bible says that when the price was paid, the life of God came back upon him. The redemption that he purchased for mankind was a redemption that enabled him to be born again too. See, the Bible says clearly that Jesus was the firstborn from from among the dead. That means his righteousness came by the blood that he shed for mankind because he was part of mankind. So your righteousness is based on the same thing that his righteousness is based on. The same blood brought about the same effect for us all. Now, we don't look at Jesus and think, well, yeah, he's righteous now, but he was sin. We see Jesus as pure and only pure, holy and only holy, sinless and only sinless. Guess what? His blood made the same thing real for you. You are just as holy as Jesus. You are just as righteous as Jesus. You are just as sinless as Jesus. Not because of you, not because we did so good standing against sin, which many of us maybe didn't do so good at, but because that's the end result of his blood that was shed. Our righteousness is of him. It really is. No, I mean it really is. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we honor you. We thank you so much for the work that you did, the sacrifice that you made. You did these things willingly with your eyes wide open to the horrors that you would have to experience in our place. But oh, thank God when that time came, when the claims of justice were satisfied, the life of God came back upon you. You were born again as a child of God, delivered under your Father, 
with honor bestowed on you and a name that's greater than any and every name there is. And then you shared that righteousness with us. Lord, we couldn't love you anymore for what you did. Open our eyes to see it in its totality. We see a little glimpse here and there. And even that little glimpse thrills our hearts. But Lord, help us to see it more clearly. Open our eyes to who we are and what we have in you. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We'll go and be righteous. Bless you, folks. Thanks for being with us.